Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled End Unwanted Callbacks, Grout Solutions, Tips and Tricks. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association. I want to welcome you for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend today's webinar sponsored by Mercury. Mercury and Sika, I'll say. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you will be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer your questions at the end of this program. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on the invite to this webinar and listen on your phone. All NTCA webinars are available to watch at any time um, on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented, giving you easy access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. All right, here we go. Today's presenter, Brett Monty, is Mercury's technical sales manager, managing the company's extensive technical training. Monty's career stretches back to 1988, working all sides of the tile industry to include ceramic tile and setting materials manufacturing, installation, sales, and distribution. Since 2007, he has provided comprehensive technical support for Mercury's renowned tile setting materials. Welcome, Brett. We look forward to another pre uh, great presentation. Thanks, Jim, for the introduction, and I'm uh, once again happy to be here and going through this. And, and as Jim mentioned, we're going to be going through unwanted callbacks and grout solutions, tips, and tricks. Um, we're really going to talk about um, some things that are, are pretty, what we consider common within uh, our industry with grouts. But uh, Jim kind of went through my introduction there. Um, again, I'm Brett Monty. Um, I'm the National Tile Technical Manager for Mercrete, been 15 years with Mercrete. Um, second generation, those uh, know me closely, know that uh, my father was in the business for many, many years. Um, CTI and CTC graduate, and uh, there's my contact information if anybody has any further or questions for me in the future. Um, you know, please write that down and uh, definitely get a hold of me. But uh, let's get started on this and let's move. So what we're going to be basically be going through today is, you know, again, talking about the grouts. Um, a grout's purpose. Uh, there's some misconceptions in there with what a grout can do. We're going to talk about types of grout in our industry. Um, there's some, you know, anywhere from standard grouts all the way up to epoxy, 100% solid epoxy grouts. Um, talking about common issues and cures, uh, advantages of certain grouts, and then simple grouting. Um, again, that's kind of where the tips, some of the tips that I've thrown in there go with. Um, there are some tips with grout that I think can help you uh, with uh, installations in the future um, and trying to end those unwanted callbacks. So rolling in, in into it here is what is a grout's purpose? Um, you know, if you look at what I've got there in the bullet points, um, a grout's purpose is really appearance, hygienic, and protection. Um, with that appearance, as a manufacturer, the only thing that we manufacture on the mercury side of the business that the end user sees is the grout. And unfortunately, um, that can be the make or break of a job. I'm sure we've all experienced that sometime in the past, the color of the grout, um, what they want it to achieve with the look of the tile. Um, you know, the grout's really purpose is, one of the purposes is appearance. What's it gonna look like? What's it gonna make my tile look like? Um, the other end there is hygienic, um, and I think this is where a lot of people don't understand um, one of these purposes, and that's the hygienic part where, you know, you have a lot of installations where people want to butt tile up next to each other, and if food or debris or dirt and things get down in that, you're never going to get them out, or they get below the tile, they're going to cause harmful mold and mildew. Um, so there is a hygienic purpose of grout, even just like having a low grout joint, which we're gonna talk about a little later on. Um, and then protection, grout works as a cushion between the tiles that help prevent edge chipping. And again, that goes back to butting tiles up. If you've got uh, tiles butted up next to each other and there's what I've always referred to as knuckling, um, where there's maybe a little movement or just a tiny bit of deflection over a wood substrate, it's going to end up chipping the edges of the tile. So it works as that protection or that cushion between the, the tiles um, to help prevent that edge chipping. 
Um, so really, you know, there's some more purposes of grout, but really those are kind of the three main objectives of grout. It's the appearance, it's the hygienic part of it, and it's the protection part of it. It's protecting the edges of that tile. Um, one of the misconceptions on tile or grout is uh, people tend to believe that grout is soft enough to work as a perimeter soft joint. Um, that is completely false. Um, if you're following the EJ171 rules out of the NTCNA handbook, um, what we're looking at is an open joint um, or open perimeter joints. So that way it allows expansion contraction. If you hard grout that in, um, you know, it could debond tiles if there's too much expansion in it. Um, it's not giving that tile anywhere to expand or contract to. Um, so, you know, misconceptions in there is that grout it works as that uh, perimeter soft joint. It does not. We need appropriate appropriate sealant or cut color match sealant. And those or just left open where you're going to put the base on top of it and you're not going to see it. So when we talk about types of grouts, what types of grouts are there? Um, what are we normally doing? Jim and I were just kind of talking about this a moment ago with uh, the popularity of some of the grouts that are starting to really rise up within our industries. But when you break the grouts out, and there's probably a few more out there, um, furans, resins, and other things, but these are kind of your standard everyday grouts that we're seeing. And the first one is that standard cement grout, um, 118.6. My story, when I started with Mercury, the only grout that we had 16 years ago was epoxy grout, and I was completely fine with that. Uh, but unfortunately, industry kind of drives where we go as a manufacturer, and you have standard cement grouts, high-performance grouts, epoxies, and ready-to-uses, which are going to be the newer additions to the grout families. But when you're talking about standard grouts, the ANSI 118.6 grout, um, you know, we as a manufacturer, we put, you know, we have the the cement, the graded sand, the polymers, all the ingredients to help that grout perform at its best. But when you look at the basis of it, it's still a standard cement grout. So with that grout typically comes with some precautionary um, items with it, meaning that they're typically gonna be a little bit more water sensitive, uh, meaning that water that you're mixing it with, you have the exact amount of water that you're cleaning it with um, and, and how much water you're cleaning with it. It's, it's a little, less forgiving than some of the other grouts. So that's standard cement grout. We have high performance grouts, which I'm so happy to see the industry really trending toward these high performance 118.7 grouts. Um, high performance grouts, they're gonna kind of look the same in that definition right there, factory prepared mixture that is a polymer modified and cement base. But there's some other things that we're putting into these. Sometimes it's gonna be a calcium aluminate, hydraulic cements, and some other types of polymers and pigments that we put in them and really what these do is they help you know help with resisting shrinking they help with resisting that color or or, or getting blotchy or or having color washed out they're a little less or a little yeah a little less sensitive on that water mixture um, and they're going to dry denser and harder um, and sometimes faster depending on the manufacturer. But uh, the high performance grouts, I've always said that uh, if you go back 10 years ago, people didn't really want to spend money because these grouts were out there, um, but they didn't want to spend that, you know, their, their hard earned money on a more expensive grout. Um, so they went with the standard cement grouts. Well, we're not hearing that as much nowadays because tiles have gotten larger, grout joints have gotten smaller. So in turn, a grout that maybe, or a job that took 10 bags of standard cement grout to do back because the tile was smaller and the joints were a little bit bigger 10 years ago, now you're using half that amount, if not less than that, on these larger tiles and smaller grout joints. So the amount of grout that we're selling as a manufacturer has actually lessened, but it's also been more in the higher performance grout. So I think people are starting to see um, the value in these high performance grouts because you know, who likes callbacks? Raise your hand. Um, I bet you nobody's raising their hand. Um, so high performance grout is going to really help you in those installations and getting you where you need to get, complete the job and have a beautiful job that's going to be sustaining and long lasting. Uh, the next on there is epoxy grouts. Epoxy grouts, um, I'll tell you what, when you, when people hear the word epoxy, if I could see everybody's faces right now, um, there'd probably be a few of you that would be cringing. Um, when you hear that word epoxy. But being in this industry for over 
35 years, um, epoxy used to be difficult to use and it was a scary product. Um, and I probably cringed a few days. Now, um, I'll tell you the epoxies that are out there are so much easier to use and so well worth the money. Um, you know, 100% of solid epoxy systems are typically gonna be that part A, part B um, type of product. You mix them together, you add your color filler into it, which is either gonna be a silica, sometimes other companies use little plastics, um, but that's your color. It's very difficult to have a epoxy job gone wrong if you just follow the simple directions on it. And we'll talk about epoxies and the high performance grass a little later in this. Um, ready to use acrylic grout. That's the newer um, grout to the families, and these are the pre-mixed, open the bucket, ready to use, put the lid back on it, use it on the next job. Um, you're starting to see some really great, um, I don't want to say inventions, but for, but for ads to these products from when they originally started. When they originally started, um, the first one I remember was a urethane, and it was a very difficult product to clean. If you didn't clean it up, you'd end up with a urethane um, residue that was just difficult to get off. Um, now most of these are acrylic based, um, acrylic polymer resins, and they're super simple to use, super simple to clean. They got some great advantages to them um, in the sense that you don't have to seal them. They do have a little bit of a flexibility to these products. Um, the only concern you have to really worry about with the ready to use grouts is the area of use. Um, some manufacturers have them where you can't use them in wet areas or even intermittent wet areas. Um, we have a product that we're launching here just within the next few weeks that will be a ready-to-use grout that can be used in intermittent wet areas. It can be used on shower walls and shower floors, but you don't want to use mixed area. Um, you don't want to use them in submersed environments. So there are some things. So really what it comes down to is choosing that right grout for the right job, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later. So moving to the next page here, common issues. And I'm sure we've seen a lot of these, whether it be on your own job, walking in the mall, walking at a restaurant, walking outside of a building, um, but we see these probably more so than others since we are in the tile business, these are what we're looking for. Um, I, I probably say I've got a really weak neck because I tend to walk with my head down looking at tile installations everywhere I go. But hey, I found a lot of dimes and quarters that way. Um, some of these common grout issues, and we're gonna break these down um, going through these, is we're looking at efflorescence, latex migration, Crack grout joints, low grout joints, pinholes, and an inconsistent color and shading. Now, again, as a manufacturer being on the technical side of our business, I have to say that 80% uh, or better of our calls that we get or complaints or, or, or technical issues that we get are grout related. Uh, but also too, a grout that's cracking um, it might be more than just the grout itself, and we're going to talk about that. We'll break these down. Um, so efflorescence, common grout issues is, is what we're looking at here. So efflorescence, it's a whitish powder or crusty crystalline deposits appearing on the joint or along the edge of the tile, mostly seen on exterior applications or over mortar beds. Um, you know, if you've never seen efflorescence or if you haven't really connected the dots, um, I can give a great example, especially where I'm at in Chicago right now. It's 30 some odd degrees outside, it's snowing. Um, started snowing this morning, they've salted some of the roads. And you ever pull a vehicle in, even for uh, you West Coast people or Southern people that just don't get snow, um, pull your car in the garage after a rain and your car's wet, drips down on the concrete. You come back the next morning and you might see this white film on the concrete kind of around your tires. That's typically gonna be efflorescence. Um, there is one way to tell if it's efflorescence and this is my joke of the day, but it is true. If you take the efflorescence, rub your finger on it, touch it to your tongue, if it tastes salty, it's efflorescence. If it doesn't taste salty, be careful what you lick. Ha ha, joke for the day. So um, efflorescence, common problem, really common problem, especially in areas that have a lot of uh, moisture in their soils um, or below their substrates that is um, pushing up through hydrostatic pressure. Pressure. We're using Portland cement-based products, um, which are high alkalinity, which can cause efflorescence on its own. So, um, you know, perfect storm is going to be a cement board over a mortar. You're setting your tile that hasn't cured out all the way. You put your grout in it that's still wet, Portland cement-based, and you've got all this moisture that's trying to cure out. 
And so what happens is it leaves those efflorescence on top if there's a lot of alkali in that uh, system that you just put in. So how to prevent or minimize efflorescence? As I just said, that mortar bed is letting it cure out, properly cure out before you come in and grout. Um, a lot of us will go in, install one day, come back the next day and grout. Um, in most cases, that's gonna be pretty sufficient, but keep in mind, depending on the surface or substrate that you're going over, if there's not much porosity to it, or if you've got a membrane that's gonna be impervious that you put down. So the only way that mortar is gonna cure is actually through the grout joints by evaporation. Um, so sort of things allow that mortar bed to properly cure out, especially if it's a, a mud bed. Um, in some cases, a vapor mitigation system may be required. Um, you know, we should all be testing in our markets when we're going over concrete, um, some type of calcium chloride test or RH test to see what type of moisture that slab is producing. Um, some high performance grouts will help resist efflorescence. Um, I know that when you look at the bullet points on a lot of grouts that are out there, especially ours, um, the grouts that we have, we resist efflorescence, doesn't stop it completely, but it will help resist the efflorescence. Um, and then make sure that grout joint is full and compact. Um, and you're gonna see that bullet point on a lot of these, is making sure that that joint has full, or it's full of grout, so that way there's no air pockets in there for any moisture to get in there. Um, and it makes it thinner on top to where it can come through and cause other issues as well. So again, back with the common grout issues. Um, that looked kind of like a little bird poop on top of that uh, tile right there, but latex migration. Um, you know, it's white rubbery substance coming through the joints. Typically when you feel it, don't lick this one, by the way. Um, when you feel it, it's gonna kind of feel rubbery to you. It might feel like it's plasticized. Um, mostly seen in applications that are submersed or high use moisture areas. Um, I've had some complaints over the years that I've, I, I've addressed and, and went and looked at where there were fountains or jacuzzis where they installed tile, they were maybe mosaics or glass mosaics through this entire beautiful waterfall or jacuzzi and they go ahead and grout and they fill it with water, not allowing that typical 21 to 28 days for everything to cure out. So that way we've got a cured system. So when you're reintroducing water to it, you don't have those latexes re-emulsifying and coming to that surface. So how to prevent, minimize latex migration is allow that mortar or grout to complete cure completely cure before submersing. Um, that's the probably the biggest um, issue that we see out there. They're not letting it come on. People wanna get in that jacuzzi sooner. They don't wanna wait the 28 days. Um, only use manufacturer's recommended mixture of water latex when mixing. Um, and, and when I put that, we'll focus on the latex word, is I've heard lately a lot of people adding latexes to products that are already what we consider polymer modified. Um, that is not a good thing. Um, when you're adding latex to these products that are already designed to work with that dry dispersible latex that's in it, um, you're adding a latex that's not needed. So really, it could weaken the grout. It could cause what we're seeing right here in the picture with the latex migration. Um, you may not have the PSI or the density and, and turn weakening that grout. So I've always used the analogy of if I had a cake box and I was following the cake mix on the back of it, but I decided to add one more extra egg and one more cup of vegetable oil, um, will that cake paste or be the same? Yep, probably not. Um, it, it, there's a reason those directions are there. And as a manufacturer, we recommend following those. If it ever comes to a concern where you wanna add latex to something, definitely get a hold of that manufacturer and ask them if, uh, if that can be done. Um, and that last bullet point, do not add latexes to products that do not need it. Um, again, that's just what I talked about, uh, but we're reiterating it again. Okay, common grout issues again, crap grout joints. Um, I'm gonna give you a little, there, there's a little tip and trick on this one. Typically when you see that crack that looks like this picture where it's running parallel to the tiles, um, there's a reason that, kraut, that grout cracked um, the length of it. Typically that's going to be because there's movement. There's some type of, whether it's movement in the substrate through expansion, contraction, um, deflection, hollow tiles, anything to those uh, effects. Now, if you see a cracked grout joint, and I saw this picture the other day, I didn't comment on it, um, on one of the uh, social media groups where there was actually cracked grout joints that were going from edge to edge, from across, kind of across that grout joint. Typically, when you see those types of cracks, that is a shrinkage crack. Either it was the wrong grout chosen for that size of grout joint, like an unsanded, maybe it was an eighth inch or larger grout joint, and they used that, that unsanded, 
or they mix the grout up with too much water, um, really making it a weaker grout and kind of dispersing all the, the polymers and the cements and, and aggregates that we put in these products. Um, so that's kind of one of those things to look at. If you see a crack like you see in the picture there, typically that's caused by some type of movement. But if you see cracks going from edge to edge, um, and it typically that's going to be shrinkage cracks. So how to prevent these? Uh, make sure tiles are well bonded and proper expansion joints are used according to EJ171. Kind of talked about it at the very beginning is we want to make sure that we're leaving expansion contraction for these floors, allowing them to breathe, allowing them to expand and contract each day. Um, we want to make sure those products are well bonded. Um, a, a little fun story here is I had a customer that was doing a epoxy grout job at a Dunkin' Donuts. And what happened is they only needed, I think it was about 25 buckets of epoxy to do the entire job. Um, they ended up using close to 60 buckets of uh, epoxy and it was simply because they didn't have coverage. And if you understand how epoxy works, it goes through a chemical stage of actually getting looser. It kind of starts at one consistent, gets a little looser in consistency before it starts to cure out. Well, what happened is, because those tiles were hollow in a lot of places underneath, they didn't have the coverage, it actually ran underneath it. And so it looked like that grout wasn't even there or it was only halfway in the joints. It almost looked like it shrank. So make sure you got the coverage in there. Um, over wood substrates, make sure needed deflection values are met before installing tile and grout. If that deflection value is not gonna work, um, we can make grout bend a little, we can make thin set or your mortar bend a little, but one thing we can't make bend is tile. And when you have those rigid surfaces, if there's any deflection, one of the first things you're gonna see is a cracked grout joint. Uh, mix grout to manufacturer's instructions. Carefully measure water and mixing, mix at low speeds. Um, as I was saying earlier, we've seen those cracks that go from edge to edge where it tends to be that shrinkage type of crack. So what happened is, um, either it's the wrong grout or they use too much water when they mix it up. Um, wait the manufacturer's recommended time to clean the grout. Um, you know, that if you're getting on it too soon, you're pulling it out of the joint, you're, you're pulling pigments out of it, um, you're weakening that grout, causing a possible another issue for it to crack. Um, do not clean tool grout with excessive amounts of water. Uh, you know, some people have their way of doing grout and some people do a, a two wash system. I've always done a single wash system where I slurry tool my joints, wipe it clean, and that's the last I touch it until I come back and I buff off uh, any residue or haze that's left over. Uh, but we want to try to introduce as little water to these products while we're cleaning them. Um, so that's one of the, the, the things to do in that. Um, and crack isolations may be required. Um, you know, we are manufacturer crack isolation membranes and we truly believe in them. They're, they are an assurance. If you're going over a substrate, whether it be new or old, um, and we talked about this actually in my webinar at the beginning of the year, Crack Kills, is um, that crack isolation membrane, that insurance can prevent that tile or that crop from cracking if there's any in-plane movements less than an eighth inch. Okay, low joints. I see this one quite often virtually on walls and floors pretty much everywhere I go, but joints that are not completely full or sit below the edge of the tile. So when you've got a grout joint that sits below, um, what's gonna happen? It's gonna collect a breeze, it's gonna get dirtier faster. Um, when they use a wet mop to clean that floor, it's gonna hold water um, in those joints. So when you have that um, low joint, it's causing a lot of issues um, in that sense for looks. Um, as well as if there's any minimal lippage on those floors that still fit in with requirements, they're going to be expanded. You're going to see those a little bit better or more when uh, you have that low grout joint. Um, how does that typically happen? People get on it too soon and wash it out, and they pull that grout right out of the grout joint. Um, so make sure joints are full or, or packed full at time of grouting. I've always done, if you've anybody, if any of you all have ever been in any of my classes when I'm doing a grouting demonstration, I always show how you know it's full. And that's when you take that grout float, you typically hit your joints at a 45, compacting the mortar into those joints that it almost, the joints, when it's full, it almost speed bumps on top of it. It almost creates a mound because it can't take any more and it pushes out what you just tried to shove in. That's how you know you've got a full grout joint. Um, using the appropriate grout floats. Um, 
you've got the the soft gum floats and then you've got the urethane or the epoxy floats um, that are really popular depending on that type of tile if it's a cushioned edge tile um, where that grout joint is going to sit just below right at that cushioned edge or if it's a stone or a rectified where they got the micro bevels on it you want it sitting a little higher um, you might be using an epoxy float um, or a urethane float for those are a little bit denser um, in material mix grout to manufacturer's instructions carefully measuring water and mixing at low speeds um, we're going to talk about measuring water here in just a little while um, but you want to mix that to the manufacturer's instructions um, there's too many people out there that uh, we see eyeballing and job site scientists are uh, typically not recommended um, by manufacturers use the appropriate amount of water when mixing the grout don't clean it up too soon and don't use or, or take your sponge difficult you know and push really hard pulling that joint that soft grout out of the joints um, wait the manufacturer's recommended time to clean grout um, that's a big one uh, i always when i'm doing my grout trainings ask people and i kind of go around person for person is how long do you wait before you clean your grout how long do you wait before you clean your grout and i'll get a five minutes i'll get an immediately i'll get an hour i'll get 45 minutes all these different cases of when they need to clean grout and I'm sure everybody I'm talking to here right now knows exactly what I'm going to say. And that is when you can firmly touch that grout and it does not transfer to your finger, that's when it's time to clean the grout. So we know that it's not going to be too soft and we're going to get on it. And that could be 10 minutes, depending on the grout manufacturer. That could be an hour, could be depending on weather, um, anything to that effect. So there is no real time to it. It's actually when we can touch that grout and it firmly and it doesn't transfer another one of the key things that we look at with that is if you've been in the industry a long long time um, like myself and my family have is we used to use the old way of when it hazes over on top of the tile it's time to clean it well that's quite different nowadays and that's because of the body or the makeup of the tiles that we're installing so when you had mostly ceramic tiles that we're installing in the older days um, they were pulling in that moisture into the body from the grout as well as it was evaporating on top so that grout was curing or drying faster enabling us to get on it quicker but now that the majority of the tiles are being installed are porcelain tiles well they're 0.05 or less absorption and they're going to really not pull in hardly any water, so we're allowing on evaporation. So they're going to haze over on top, a porcelain tile is, um, a lot faster or a lot slower than a ceramic tile or a, or a ceramic body tile um, would. So that's one thing to look at. Know the type of tile that you're installing because that will kind of give you an idea of how fast that grout's going to dry as you're, you're, you're doing it and ready to clean it up. Um, do not clean tool grout with excessive amounts of water. Again, if you get on it with that a lot of water, um, you could cause some other issues like shading, but also too, you're gonna be able to pull that grout out a lot easier. So as I said earlier, we wanna use as little water to clean up grout as possible when we're working on that grout. Okay, pinholes. Um, you know, the last job I did, which was a few years ago, um, I experienced pinholes and I figured out why. I did, and it was because I was using a really high-speed mixer, uh, my DeWalt mixer that I use for drilling, and I basically spun it too quick, and I put pinholes or I put air bubbles in that. So um, we see this. Um, it's very unattractive. Um, can it be fixed? Sure, it can be fixed. You can start putting grout back in it or take it out and regrout in that area, but a lot of times when you do that, that area is not going to match up completely with the rest of the job. Um, how do you avoid pinholes? Uh, my first bullet point, which I made that mistake, was do not use a high-speed mixer. Uh, when you use high-speed mixers or the wrong mixing blade, is you're introducing air into that. You're whipping air into it. And so when you go to compact it in there, those air bubbles are there. And typically, they show up as you're tooling and cleaning that grout joint because you're adding some moisture. Those You get those little pinholes that pop up. Um, you want to fully pack your grout joints. You want to make sure that grout joint is fully packed. Uh, mix grout to manufacturer's instructions. Once again, we're saying the same thing and using that low speed mixer. If you have too wet of a grout, then it's more than likely going to cause pinholes. Um, again, wait the manufacturer for recommended time to clean the grout. That is what, what do we do? We firmly touch it and we wait for, for no transfer. And do not clean tool grout with excessive amounts of water. You kind of notice there's a trend there on those uh, last two uh, bullet points 
for these is once again, we don't want to add excessive water to us. The more water you introduce it, the more problems that you can have. All right, and consistent color. Get this a lot. Get this uh, there. This may not be the greatest of pictures of examples on it, but we see something that looks just like that um, that comes up with these where we see these fully packed grout joints or we, or we see these grout joints where we're getting these light shades and dark shades. Um, I've had an instance where... I was looking at, of course, larger tiles, not in this picture, and I could see this light, dark, light, dark, light, dark kind of shading running down the edge of the tiles in some of the areas. And I asked the installer that happened to be on the job, what type of, what size trowel did you use? And uh, it was a quarter by three eighths. I grabbed that quarter by three eighths, I put it right next to those, and guess what? Those grout joints matched um, on the shading each where each notch was on those, on that trowel. And so, Bullet point number two makes a lot of sense in that, is allow two thirds of the thickness of the tile to be open for grout. Um, we wanna make sure our grout joints are clean. If you've got those ups and downs, ups and downs from your trowel ridges between your tiles, um, and it wasn't cleaned out or raked out prior to grouting, um, you're gonna have a high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. And the faster a grout dries, the lighter it's going to be. The slower a grout dries, the truer or darker the color it's going to be. Um, so when you have those highs and lows, um, that's something to, to look out for, that it could cause inconsistent drying within that grout. Um, again, we as manufacturers, we try to put all these different chemicals and raw materials and products in these grouts to prevent that from happening, to keep them from drying out at different rates. But when the grout joint's not working with us, sometimes that grout just isn't capable of that uh, being able to dry out at that consistent uh, speed so having those grout joints clean and open can make a big difference uh, mix grout to manufacturer's instructions carefully measure water and mixing at a low speed again it's that mix to manufacturer's instructions measuring water um, and again the other bullet point wait till manufacturer's recommended time to clean the grout how long firmly touch it doesn't transfer to the finger um, and to and and once again, do not use excessive water to clean the grout joints. When you leave water in these joints, especially if they're low joints, um, that can cause shading in that area. It could pull uh, polymers or efflorescence or even some latex to the top of the surface causing co discoloration. Now, one of the best ways to fix this is you've got grout colorants out there. We manufacture grout colorants. I know a lot of our uh, other manufacturers that are out there have grout colorants, and these are professional grade grout colorants where you can change the colors or fix these issues. We use those and recommend them a lot um, for applications where that grout looks great, except for the shading. Um, and it, it is a good way, an easy way to fix it. Okay, so let's go through some slides here, kind of coming through the back end of this is, you know, what not to do. Um, this is a job I went on and they were complaining of broken grout joints crack grout joints. And so you can see kind of really what happened here. Um, I pulled one of the easier tiles to pull up, which was around the uh, air duct and or the, the vent, the register, and pulled it up. And you can pretty much see what happened there. If you look at the what was left there and also what was left on the tile, they really did not meet that uh, required percentage of bond, which is 80% for anterior applications. Um, and get the bond. So what was happening, they were getting movement in the tiles. It just not, was not able to withstand um, the impacts, the vibrations, because this was over a subfloor, wood subfloor, um, causing these tiles to be loose. And in turn, the tiles weren't cracked. It was the grout joints that cracked. So um, pretty sure this is the problem that caused it. Um, here's another instance, kind of the same scenario. We went out there because of cracked grout joints, as you can see as the picture there on the right-hand side that I circled. It's that crack running down that edge of that tile, and you can see where it's kind of knuckled or chipped away even at the grout joint from that expansion, contraction, and that movement. I started to pull up a piece of tile, and once again, I see those beautiful trowel marks. Man, he did a great job of going straight, but we didn't achieve the coverage. Um, we didn't even achieve, achieve transfer on this. They could have installed the tiles right back down on the floor. They either bought the one-sided thin set, or if you look at the back of this, um, some of you might be able to tell us, is see all that white that's on the back of it. That is a release mold um, that's there in the part of manufacturing of tile. If some of these tiles that have a lot of that re release mold um, dust that's on it, it needs to be wiped off prior to installation because it is a bond breaker. But ultimately we're talking about grout. So 
again, we went out there for crack drop joints and this is what we saw. They didn't have the coverage that was needed um, behind these tiles, causing the tiles to be loose. So it wasn't the grout's fault, it was actually the tile's fault. And a wonderful picture of efflorescence. I've heard uh, a lot of people say putting uh, mosaics or these stone mosaics or pebbles on the shower floors is a bad idea. Well, I couldn't agree with them more. Um, this floor, when we threw a level on it, um, you could see where it was low. And you could still even some water standing in that area after we kind of took a little cup and poured some water in there. It was sitting in those joints. And when it sits there for an excessively amount of time over a mud bed, um, and it's not draining to the drain properly, it, we're, we're getting efflorescence. Um, it's just not working. You can see that shower pan on the picture on the right. There's a few spots, even in other places where they had it, but really that main area to the right of the drain um, was the biggest problem. And you know, when we have showers um, and, and using waterproof membranes and floating these, or using these pre-made pans, it's water in, water out. We do not want water standing. Typically, when you use pebble stones or stones on these shower floors, um, if those joints aren't full, um, and sometimes it's difficult depending on the shape of the stones, um, you might have water sitting there um, in between them, no matter how much you've got a pitched floor on that. So that's a great example of efflorescence. Okay, and I always throw this one in for fun too. Um, what do we see there? That beautiful dot mount. Um, that is a prime example of what could happen when you go to grout this is a you're gonna have a hard time getting full grout joints because there is if you look at that bottom part of that picture down where that block wall is there is a good size gap behind that uh, tile that's installed there and i'm assuming the rest are like that so when you go in and grout this a you go to fill the joints there's a good chance you're going to push it right through and into the back of that tile but the other thing too is um you could end up with low joints. You could end up with um, these hollow tiles that are sounding there. Uh, it's just not a recommended way, and this kind of goes over that coverage. Make sure we have the right amount of coverage behind these installations. Um, wonderful job here that I went on, and this kind of goes back to, once again, it was a complaint of not only cracked tiles, but also cracked grout joints. Um, this is what happens when you hard grout an installation. If you look at the picture on the right, that's a slider um, going out to the backyard, and that's hard grout in that joint there. Um, all around the walls, um, you can see that they've got the six inch beautiful baseboard there. Um, it was hard grouted in, but not only did they hard grout there, they hard grouted around the islands and everywhere else. So there was no room for expansion contraction in this floor. Um, it looks like there's no thin sits there because we actually scraped it up um, in that area right there to, to get some samples of things. But uh, they had good coverage but unfortunately that floor just expanded and expanded without the appropriate rules of ej171 and caused crack jo grout joints as well as teeping or tenting in it so let's talk about some solutions or some items that can be used to help with these or help with some of these issues that are there um, it still takes you to prevent a forest fire um, it still takes you to prevent a, a grout failure but High performance grouts really help in alleviating a lot of that pain that we see out there. They have less shrinkage, less water absorption. They're more resistant to staining, higher PSI. Typically with these grouts, you can go from that 16th inch up to a half inch. So it kind of leaves that guesswork of, do I need a sanded or an unsanded? They have better color consistency because of the pigments and the polymers and the cements that we're using in these. Um, they're more resistant to left fluorescence, once again, because of the products that we're using to make these. And a lot of cases, they are faster setting. People want to get on that grout job really quick to basically collect their check and get out of there. It's the last thing you got to do. Um, so they're typically faster setting, depending on the manufacturer um, in these. So you can really get that job completed with a far better product than a Portland cement grout. There is a place for Portland cement or your basic grade grouts, but we're again, like I said earlier, these 118.7 high performance grouts are really starting to trend up. And us as manufacturers, me on the technical side, I love to see that because that lessens phone calls that I get. Um, but these high performance grouts, again, most manufacturers, they come in most of their color lines. They're, they're uh, just as easy to use as a standard Portland cement based grout other than they can be a little bit typically faster and drying. 
um, but they are great grouts. I highly recommend them if you haven't tried one yet. Um, try one out there, find a manufacturer that has one. We've got a series called Pro Grout Plus, which hits all these bullet points, um, and they're truly great grouts. They really are. They're worth the money. Um, and epoxy grouts. Um, I am an epoxy person. Typically, if somebody asks me to do demos um, at a distributor or contractor, I'm always adding in epoxy to it because there's such a wow factor to it. Um, some epoxies have 50% less water absorption. Um, they are chemical resistant. They're resist staining. Um, there's no sealers needed. They are high PSI. Again, they can go from 16th inch up to half inch, depending on the manufacturer. They're color consistent. Um, no efflorescence, and they're easy to use nowadays. Um, I know with our epoxy, we put a surfactant in it, which is actually a fancy word for soap. Um, so when you go to clean this product, it actually foams up on you. And when that foam is there present, you're seeing the actual soap. So when you go to clean it, it actually doesn't leave that kind of filmy residue that you typically see when using epoxies. But they're so much easier to use. Um, nowadays, there's modified epoxy systems out there. I'm 100% epoxy grout system. I always use this as my little story is I'm in my home, I've got three bathrooms. And at one point in time, up to a year ago, there was five boys living in this house, including me. And so when you have a bathroom and boys and aiming issues, um, having a good grout or a very chemical and stain resistant grout is highly recommended. Um, and I, I can't, my grout, and my bathroom floors look fantastic. Um, they still need to be cleaned just like a regular grout, but when I clean it, it looks like it's brand new again. Um, so again, epoxy grouts are fantastic. Um, they are a great upsell um, to customers for you contractors out there. Find an epoxy that you like, find one that uh, is easy to use for you, one that you're comfortable with and start using it and promoting it as a chemical and stain resistant grout application. You know, you can become an epoxy grout specialist and uh, make more money on the job. Okay, we're almost finished up here, some do's and don'ts. Um, do, use the right grout for the application. Um, you know, we know the difference in sanded's and non-sanded's. Non-sanded's are eighth inch and smaller grout joints, sanded's are eighth inch and larger, up to half inch sometimes, some people will go a little bit bigger. Um, mix entire bag or dry mix entire bag. We're gonna talk about that one in a minute. Um, measure water for mixing. We're gonna talk about that one here, I got some slides on that, but measuring the water is very important. Um, use appropriate tools. Um, you want to use grout floats. You don't want to use a steel flat edge trowel. Yes, I've seen it um, trying to push grout and you're going to scratch tile and, and not have the best of looking grout joints. Um, fully packed joints, make sure they're fully packed. Ensure tiles have appropriate coverage, no dot mount. Make sure that we're getting good coverage in there. Uh, make sure joints are two thirds free. And that's an industry recommendation. That way we get a full grout joint. Use clean water. We're going to talk about that one in a minute. I got a great story for that. Use EJ171 in all cases. Um, there's no reason you shouldn't be following, um, whether they be perimeter joints, interior corner joints, um, wherever those joints are going to be or where two transitions change a plane, um, we want to refer to the EJ171. Uh, make sure grout joint is ready for cleaning. Don't get on it too soon. Use little water when cleaning. Once again, we don't want to introduce a lot of water to a fresh grout. I'm in the follow the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, now my don't list is not as big as my do list, but uh, there's more in there. There's all kinds of don'ts we can go daily, daily, but I just kind of picked out some, some ones that we more see on a daily basis, but don't eyeball the water ratio. Again, we're gonna talk about water ratio in just a moment while we finish up. Um, don't let puddle or don't let the water puddle when you're cleaning. So when you take that sponge, dip it out of your bucket. If you drip a bunch of water on top of your grout joints, wipe it up quickly and just don't let it sit there. Um, don't use a high speed mixer. Um, again, that's going to put pinholes in your grout. We want to use 300 RPMs or less. Um, don't get on it and clean too soon. Um, don't hard grout perimeter joints and don't leave air pockets in the joints. So these are kind of some don'ts in there. They sound very simple. Um, Jim and I were talking earlier that sometimes, you know, these simple re-educations or reintroducing these uh, webinars or demonstrations out there are something that we're focusing on um, to kind of get those simple things back in minds that maybe we either forgot or kind of got um, a little complacent on. So here's one of my little picture things here. You're gonna have to walk through me with, walk, walk this, little journey with me. Um, 
on the top of that, it says mix entire bag. Um, there's a reason for we we as a manufacturer want you to mix the entire bag or at least dry mix the product if you're only use partial. And my pictures kind of tell a story here that I'll kind of run through with. So when we start off of the plant, that bag is standing up. Standing up on end, it gets filled up and it falls down and it goes down a little conveyor belt down to a pallet. Stack pallet gets stacked, gets shrink wrapped, forklift picks it up, puts it in the rack of the warehouse. Then somebody orders it, they take it, forklift. Put it in the back of a truck it ships three states two states however far away it goes um, across to the distributor gets on a forklift again gets to the distributor's place either the distributor puts the pallet up in the rack or they hand stack it in the rack um, and individual stacks you as a contractor come in order your material they take your grout they set it on top of your pallet you put it in the back of your truck you go out to your job to your home there and let's say you're only using half the bag of grout that's all you need so you Take the bag you tilt it up you cut off the top of it and what do you see you see grout you take out half of it and you mix it well what do you think's missing in that um if you take that bag of grout and if you kind of got where i was going with this from the point of once it goes down the conveyor belt all the way to that home or into the truck there's a lot of vibration going on there's a lot of movement and vibration but yet that bag is still sitting stagnant so what i always say is what do you find in the bottom of that bag? Or just like, what do you find in the bottom of a box of Frosted Flakes? The sugar, all the good stuff. So think of grout as that same thing. So when that grout sits there and vibrates and it's laying on its side, like the picture right there in the middle, it's more of an exaggeration there, but you have settling of different products, your pigments, your aggregates, your polymers, all these different raw materials that we have in these bags are different size material or different size shapes and sizes to where that vibration starts to settle so when you just pick up that bag open the top of it and pour out half of it you're kind of missing the good stuff so we're going to recommend as always mixing the entire bag even if you only need a little bit or at the very least you take it you pour it into a bucket dry you mix it up whether it be by hand or throw a mixer in there and do some dry mixing and then take what you need now at the very least is you take that bag and you basically drop it on the ground and you start flipping it over, end over end, side over side, trying to get those contents mixed back up inside of it. Look kind of funny doing that to a bag, pushing it around the neighborhood, trying to mix everything in, but that is really the appropriate way to do it. So we want to make sure all the good stuff, all those sugars in the bottom of the Frosted Flakes is going to be a situation where it's all mixed into it and you're getting those right color pigments and we're not going to have to worry about shading or any other issues on the job. Now, measure mixing water. Um, you see my little picture on the left there it's got the measuring cup we all see these we've all seen them um you know some of these big box stores sell these little five quart um buckets i've got five of those out in my garage and there's five of them that have five different manufacturers names written on them and all five of those have holes drilled into the side of them. um what that's telling me is if it's a mercury grout we're requiring xyz amount of water for the pro grout plus series is it's what i refer to as my dummy or my mon monkey bucket I can hand it to anybody. They fill it up on a level surface, water pours out the side of the bucket, we pour it in, pour a bag of grout in it, and we get the same consistency of water ratio every single time. Here's the importance in that. If this is a multi-bag job and you've got a darker colored grout, let's say it's a chocolate brown, um, and you're using your eyeballs or somebody's using their eyeballs to measure the water, they put the powder in, they mix, go, oh, it's not thick enough. They put a little more powder in. Or yeah, a little more powder, or it's too wet, they um, pour powder, and I'm getting mixed up in my words, but you know where I'm going, is they're not measuring it. So what happens is, if it's a large job, multi-bag job, they can end up with chocolate brown in one area, light chocolate brown in an air, other area, medium chocolate brown in another area. We want you to measure the water. The example I use when I'm doing my trainings is, if I take two glasses of coffee, fill them both up equally, I put a little bit of water in one and a little bit more water in the other one, what have I done? I've changed the color of that coffee. That's no different with grout. With grout, these are color pigmented products. So measure the water is so important. Now, we talked about water and clean water. Um, this is probably one of my stories that was just absolutely floored me when I went out to the job and took Latin. But we want to use clean water for mixing and cleanup. And I'm kind of really emphasizing on that and cleanup. Um, clean water. 
when we say clean water, that means we don't, some areas with well water might have some minerals or irons or some things in it that might cause that grout to show a rusty color or change the color of it. We want clean water. Now, I went out on a job in Palm Springs and beautiful 24 by 24 white polished porcelain floor. I get the phone call, the white grout that was installed saying the grout was green, had this green tint to it. And it's like, okay, I've never heard of that one before. Went out there, I got my contractor recliner, which is a bucket, set it down in the middle floor. Homeowner hadn't moved in yet. And I'm looking around going, wow, Morty B, this grout does have a little bit of a light green tint to it. And I asked the general contract that was there, where's the installer at? And he goes, well, he's next door working on the house next door. So he went and grabbed him and brought him back. And I asked him, okay, go through the steps with me. He kind of went through all the steps um, of what he did. But then I asked him, where did you get your water? And he goes, well, we trucked in. We brought our water in because there's no water at the homes. It was new construction yet um, for mixing. I go, okay, where did you get your cleanup water? Well, he didn't answer me, but he did look up and look out the back window, which the house happened to be on a golf course. And he got his cleanup water out of the water hazard, which some of these golf courses, if you're a golfer, they dye the water either blues or greens and different colors. But he actually got his cleanup water out of the water hazard. Um, the general contractor looked at me and said, all right, okay, we're done here. And that was the last discussion we had. But uh, using clean water or the appropriate type of water uh, for grouting is extremely important. And that covers it for me. So if there's any questions, uh, we'll hang on the line here. Brett, that's great. I just want to tell everyone that, you know, grouts are improving. They're getting better all the time. But always follow the uh, manufacturer's recommendation and instructions. Um, if you follow those and do these tips, uh, grouting will not be a problem, will not be uh, a difficult uh, situation. I just... Um, I've been in the business for 40 years. I've seen grouts change, but I've also seen numerous contractors think every grout's the same. You mix it the same, and uh, it isn't true. So uh, please read read the instructions. It's very important. Excellent. All right, Brett. I've got uh, a few comments and some questions here. The first one is: uh, This contractor said he's recently seen some designers showing extremely oversized grout joints. They look like about one to two inch wide grout joints with smaller, approximately four by six tiles. Woo. Any recommendation for an installation like that besides run? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that's great. Um, Cause that reminds me, my father, um, when he was alive, he always lived by the statement and he was a tile contractor. Uh, I've never had a job problem on a job I walked away from. And that couldn't be any truer. Um, you know what? But to answer the question, in all seriousness, there are some grouts that are what we call paver grouts. They're going to fall in that Portland cement category, but they're paver grouts, and they're typically going to have either a larger aggregate or more aggregate to the mixture, allowing you to get up to those bigger grout joints. Um, so you can definitely talk to some of your manufacturers um, that are in your area or distributors and see if they have those paver grouts or if they recommend um, any type of additional sand of their products to be able to meet those size grout joints. Um, their technical departments can definitely answer that for you. So it's not unheard of because if you go back to the old Satio paver days, um, you had grout joints that were one inch. Um, the, the key thing in there though is, and this is kind of addition to that, adding into that, is we have grout joint or, or you know, for example, you know, my grouts go up to a half inch maximum. That's a half inch wide grout joint. But when you have four joints coming together, you exceed that half inch. And we'll, a lot of times we'll see actually a indentation at those corners where those four corners meet because you exceeded the width of that what that grout was designed for. So that's always something to keep in mind um, for the, the type of grout that you're using, the amount of grout and the way the tile's being installed. So where those corners come together, whether at a brick joint where you've got really two corners and a flat edge coming together, it could cross over and be larger than that half inch. So that's something to definitely consider when uh, choosing or selecting your grouts. But again, to answer the question, there are some paper grouts out there that can go up to that size of grout joint. One thing you said real quickly, and I want to make sure everyone heard that, because in the South and Southeast, a lot of times you'll see Saltillo tile, and it's made to have three quarters of an inch or an inch grout line. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the look, it's the way it is. And they make specific grouts for Saltillo tile or uh, with the larger aggregate, as Brett was saying. So yeah, that's yeah. great. All right, is there a way to fix low grout joints after it dries? 
Oh boy. Um, you know, a lot of people say you just go on top of the mortar out. Um, I'm not a fan of that because depending on how long it's been sitting there, if it's a fresh job and you've got large grout joints, um, you might be able to get a fresh grout to be able to bond on top of it. Um, but a lot of cases, if it's even a month down the road and you're going to go back in and try to regrout over the top of it, um, you could end up in what I'm going to call is a delaminating to where that grout's just not going to bond because either some dirt, debris, or chemicals from just their regular everyday cleaning get on top of it. And, and it's going to basically be a contaminant between the two and it's just not going to last very long. It's not going to stick to it. My recommendation's always been is pull the grout out and redo it. And there's some really good tools for pulling grout out, some vibrating Absolutely. tools and, and uh, uh, that will not harm the edges of tile or, or chip it or anything. And, and uh, it can be done, and uh, that is the correct way to do it. I agree with Brett. All right, here's a comment. It's important to remember that all of the increased performance characteristics of a high-performance grout can all literally be washed away by the addition of too much mixed water or washing too early. Yep. So that, that's just building on your point, Brett, definitely. Absolutely. All right. The use of newer microfiber sponges for your final wash is ideal for lifting all of the standing water off the grout. I, uh, I have never really used a microfiber Sponge, can you answer that or have any comment on that, Brett? You're start, well, you're starting to see the microfiber sponges because they're more available instead of just a cloth. So it'll be a sponge that's basically wrapped in microfiber and um, they work really, really well. Um, you know, when I originally was, you know, being trained myself um, is to me, the best sponges out there are the closed loop cellular sponges. And they kind of look like a little denser material, but that little scotch bright sponge you use at your dish sink they kind of look like that but they're a little bit denser hydro sponges are good um, but ultimately on this is you want to use a good clean dew sponge for every grout job um, i've seen some sponges when i'm out working with some contractors that look like they've been through you know hell and back and you know the the texture of the sponge is actually going to mirror or or telegraph i guess would be the better way of the texture of the finished grout that you're doing. So a, I could definitely see a microfiber sponge. I've never used one personally, but I can definitely see it doing a fantastic job and being able to get you a nice smooth grout joint um, versus that rugged beat up sponge that's, you know, half of it's gone because the dog ate it. Um, it's just not gonna leave you the smoothest uh, grout joint out there. All right, this next one, it's probably more common than, than you think, but how do you answer a customer or designer who wants the shower floor and the shower walls, different colors, two different colors, one on the wall and one on the floor. Uh, a lot of tape. Um, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> a lot. I mean, it, it, it's done. You see it. Um, there's some beautiful work out there. A lot of these uh, mosaic works and jobs that are going out there, they're putting, uh, you know, different color grouts throughout a mosaic successfully. It just takes time and patience. Um, really what it does. It, um, and what you're going you say probably charge for it, charge a little bit extra for that, you yeah. know, uh, time that you're done, you're using to do that. I, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it can be done and, and it's done, you know, commonly across the, I'd probably say the globe instead of more so than just the United States, yeah. but it's just patience. And, but I would, one thing that I would definitely do is I would make sure if, I'm grouting my walls, you know, I'm gonna grout my walls first, I'm gonna grout my walls, I'm gonna let that dry. I'm not gonna immediately start doing the floor. Absolutely, for sure. All right, any special considerations for matte unglazed tile? Um, this person finds that the new grouts are very difficult to clean up with uh, on unglazed tiles. Okay, so yes. Um, when you get an unglazed tile, even if it's porcelain tile, um, if you were to look at glazes or the surface of a tile under a microscope, um, even glass has it, you're gonna see these little micro pits um, in that surface. So even though a porcelain's impervious and it's not supposed to soak up any water, there's still a texture that you can't see by your eye. And we've always, or I've always recommended using um, grout releases in any instance where you might think that, uh, especially for darker grouts, 
um, where you think it might, what I call salt and pepper, where it's gonna leave that color pigment inside of it. But one of the other things too, when we go to grout, um, prior to grouting, if you take a damp sponge and wipe off that surface with it, um, A, you're doing a couple of things. You are wiping off the surface, making sure there's no contaminants or debris there, but you're introducing a lubricant. A, it helps you push that grout around, but also too, that lubricant stays there too, and it helps you when you're floating that grout in to be able to clean it up. Um, but ultimately, with some of these tiles, you may have to do smaller areas before you move on to just doing a, a large job if it was a polished or a glazed you know, type of tile. Um, but grout releases can work. They don't leave residue behind. They clean up typically um, when you're cleaning your grout, scrubbing it and tooling your joints. Um, so a grout release might be something you wanna add to your arsenal and they're, they're pretty inexpensive. Great. All right, we've got uh, one of our attendees said, could you please describe again what grout shrinkage looks, linkage, excuse me, shrinkage looks like? Um, you mentioned it would be from edge to edge of the tile. Yes, okay, so here's, here's a picture where we see that grout crack joint there on that right-hand side is that's running that parallel. Imagine if, and you know, the thing is you guys can't see me, I'm taking my pencil and actually touching my screen with it, is instead of it running parallel or next to the grout, it would be going from edge to edge. So it's going, if that's going horizontal, the way we're looking at it, these would be going vertical in the picture. Next time I think we'll need a picture of that. Yeah, that yeah, and like, like I said, I was on a, uh, one of the, the big social media um, pages the other day and there was a picture of somebody asking about um, that low grout joint and those cracks, and I can see the cracks going directly across from edge to edge. So this same person is saying, so shrinkage would be across the joint. Okay, yes. the short way, correct. Okay. Correct. Great. Um, let's see what else we got here. As well with the new materials such as metal, um, as the tile material, are there any grouts you would not recommend for metal tiles? Um, not really, because what you're going to have to look at, and this kind of goes hand in hand with glass tiles, but also um, this comes, and I'm going to throw my my back in the tile manufacturing day hat on, is, you know, cobalt blue used to be a big color that was out there, and you'll still see it, um, and that vermilion red, um, which if you've been to an In-N-Out burger, they use the, the vermilion red. Those glazes, because the pigments tend to be softer, um, you've got glass and you've got these stone or metal tiles where look at the, what the manufacturer call their technical department and ask them what they're using as the aggregate. I know on some of the products that we manufacture, um, we use a pin sand in our epoxy as well as our ProGrout Plus. And that pin sand is a very fine rounded sand. It doesn't have any sharp edges to it. Um, it's give you an example. Um, if you've ever been to a fancy restaurant um, back in the day when they used to let you smoke, they'd have those little ashtrays in the bathrooms or whatever, and it was really fine sand. That's a pen sand. Um, those are less likely to scratch the surface of those. Um, again, test areas, if it's a, a, especially the metal tiles, test an area and see if the, uh, I hate to say it, but you may have, end up having to tape off the surface. Let's but, go a simpler route. Let's go a simpler route, Brett. Mm -hmm. If you have a grout you want to use on a metal tile or something like that, call the company, the manufacturer of that grout, and talk to their technical people. They're going to be able to tell you if that grout can be used in that situation or not. That will yeah. save so many headaches. It's just yeah. a phone call. It's very uh, simple. Also, too, not only the manufacturer of the grout is the manufacturer of the tile. If there's some Correct. ways, yeah, that, very good. You can ask them because they should have experience um, with that. Um, and have gotten that same question. Well, what a great presentation, great tips, great things to look out for, to watch out for, to you know, uh, just alleviate from your situation to make your job easier, simpler, and much better. I wanna thank all of you for attending today. I wanna thank Brett for a great program. Um, I hope all of you have a great Thanksgiving next week and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody that's attended.